Hi everybody, nice to see you here and uh, it's a pleasure to come to Cyprus and uh, tell you about uh, my topic. So I'm collaborate with uh, JetBrains a little bit, so that's why we actually organize this um, kind of uh, not, not, not very, not very uh, IT lecture or talk, but it's a very actually exciting field, astroparticle physics and multi-messenger astronomy. Uh, so I will be speaking about these two fields like most of my talk and uh, new changes in petascale era. So it's mostly uh, to what we approach with our astronomy and uh, it's maybe will be more questions to to actually IT experts and data science experts and yeah, then answers from from my. Okay, yeah. So the main point, uh, so I will try to give you like a general outline, general, let's say, uh, world picture, how we physicists or astrophysicists actually um, understand what, what's happening on in, uh, I mean, in the universe in general, not, not, not at Earth. And um, yeah, so the main point, uh, the important point that uh, actually astronomy, astrophysics and astroparticle physics, they're observational science. So comparing to other scientists uh, the planet, so we cannot design and tune the experiment. So we actually measure what we have, yeah? And uh, actually transient events are now of uh, very special importance. And uh, so that's why actually this field, uh, which I will be speaking about today is very important. Yeah, so uh, outline of my talk, yeah, I hope you are not scared about all of this, uh, yeah, uh, this topic. So I will try to give you a very brief overview of uh, cosmology and uh, astronomy. So particle physics, so there's actually two main pillars yeah, of astroparticle physics, astronomy and particle physics, yeah, obviously. And then just give your uh, brief history, so how we actually arrive to our uh, astroparticle physics and multi-messenger astronomy. So actually, I would say that this field is pretty new, so it's about 100 uh, years old. Yeah, and um, then in the very end of my talk, I will uh, quickly show you so uh, our plans of ne next generation experiments and uh, so data science projects in astroparticle physics and uh, so how we actually try to make uh, some synergies with uh, private sector like and uh, say a few words about astroparticle lab at JetBrains Research. So uh, I, I, I was trying to, to give cosmology in single slide, but I will decided to I, I decided to, to give it in two slides because uh, I know you had a lecture on, uh, on a string theory and I decided to show that we also uh, know something about quantum, quantum theory. So actually cosmology is not about the Big Bang. So Big Bang actually is the wrong term. So the matter didn't appear. So matter exists uh, even not all the time, but it just exists. Yeah, if we are materialist, not idealist. And so we actually have a vacuum which to it. So it's actually a vacuum state of a single field. And then suddenly, yeah, we can have our universe. So it's actually the modern understanding of, of the cosmology. Yeah, so um, yeah, I will try to, to, yeah, to point for, for those who will uh, yeah, listen to this uh, remotely or watching the, the slides. So yeah, so we have quack quantum and from quantum physics we know that quantum can fluctuate and uh, we have a very uh, mysterious mechanism which can actually expand the quantum fluctuations and uh, so for example we have a uh, few few um, particles which actually appears and annihilate and uh, why inflation mechanism so these particles just torn apart and uh, flux uh, and the uh, and this fluctuation expands very fast, faster than the velocity of light. So don't ask me how. Uh, we maybe can discuss this later offline. And then, yeah, and then, so this is how our local universe appears. Yeah, so no Big Bang, no God. So it's, it's simply, it's simple quantum physics. I also will not touch uh, gravity because it's also yet another field. But anyway, so, um, so on this scale, so we can see the yeah, expansion of the universe. So. Uh, by our estimation, so we have about 14 billion years, yeah, and, uh, and but actual size of universe is about, yeah, uh, more than uh, 30 billion years, yeah, because it's expanding very fast uh, in a very 
early stage we have a very yeah, dense and hot universe. So this probably you already know this uh, kind of big band theory, but it's not big band theory, it's actually uh, expansion theory. Yeah, and uh, actually what we observe is a very, very local universe. So uh, if, we, if we scale it like a redshift, so redshift is how our, um, in, 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 in how many times our universe uh, were expanded. So uh, we can observe only very nearest universe so to redshift uh, about one. I mean, with, with optical instruments uh, and uh, some, uh, uh, to, to have some precise yeah, observations. And uh, we also can observe cosmic microwave background. So it's actually, I mean, you can see even on your uh, TV, on radio, some uh, small noise, some isotropic noise. So it's actually one comes from the yeah, uh, yeah, very beginning. Uh, so-called recombination. And we also have like dark edges when we have like a cold gas which are not, uh, still not um, uh, collided into, into stars and so on. And yeah, uh, early stars formation and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and, and now, we, now, now we approach to, to the stage and I will actually be speaking only uh, about very closest distance, let's say, yeah. So uh, I will speak about particles and uh, yeah, and very high energetic particles which can uh, arrive only from nearest universe when we have this cosmic accelerators which is actually very powerful and can accelerate particles far beyond what we can do here at Earth. But this can be, of course, completely wrong because, I mean, cosmology models, uh, yeah, re uh, typically being rewritten every, I don't know, let's say decade or couple of decades. And uh, so, yeah, I, I just, I, I really like this this citation from uh, Leo Landau that uh, cosmology is often wrong, but never doubts. Yeah, so I, I'd say this is like that, but maybe not in 10 years, so we will see. Okay, so now let's come to our edges, to astronomy. So actually what we typically call astronomy is electromagnetic astronomy. So we actually measure photons or uh, gamma quanta of uh, electromagnetic field. Yeah, and uh, I very like this example from uh, of a Crab Nebula. So it's actually a remnant of supernova uh, 1054. It means it ex it's exploded 1054. I guess it was even written in some uh, manuscripts uh, from this uh, from the Middle Ages. Yeah, so now now the nebula have a diameter of a 10 uh, 11 light years and the distance of 6.5 thousand light years to the Earth. So it's, 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 it's a really nearby object. That's why we can actually study this very well. And we can study this in a very different um, um, frequencies or uh, wavelengths. Yeah, so in radio, so you can see this clouds. It's indeed a molecular cloud. So uh, the gas, uh, which uh, yeah, appears after the explosion, we can see infrared, so it's like a kind of dust. We can see optical, so it's very nice remnants, and uh, even X-rays. And here we can see actually the spinning disk of uh, of the central neutron star. So the neutron star has a diameter of 15 kilometers, and you can see this small compact, compact objects of uh, let's say diameter of 15 kilometers can uh, really accelerate the gas, and we can see this in, in uh, X-rays. Yeah, and this it's, it's pretty yeah huge distance. So uh, yeah, we, we can actually estimate the angular size of this, and this really like a parsec scale or so. Okay, so let's come to electromagnetic astronomy. So uh, again, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so in this diagram, so we can see actually uh, how different our universe and uh, for example, galaxy structures are. And uh, so actually with our eyes, yeah, we can see only, only very, very small, a small part of the spectra, so it's actually optical spectrum, but optical spectrum is yeah, it's it's produced from the excitation of the of the molecules, yeah, of the atoms. So when when one electron is uh, excited, so changing its its uh, yeah, let's say uh, energy level, and then we can emit a gamma quanta. But yeah, of course, depending on the oops, sorry of the of the structure, so it can also emit a radio quantum or a infrared. Ultraviolet, so ultraviolet is actually high energy excitation, but we can still go to very, very high energy. So to uh, to X rays, so X rays now we already have also very uh, fast process in plasma. So it's it's not like a simple electrons, but it's a process in plasma or uh, in a nuclei, and as well a gamma rays. So gamma rays is a very high energy uh, spectrum. So actually 
uh, yeah, I, I would say that uh, particles which I will be speaking about in the scales will uh, approach like end of this room. So if you, if you continue the scale, so it's really, it's a, it's 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 a, it's it's not it, we cannot really measure already like a, like a, just a fluctuation. So it's it's really like a, a particle, yeah, like a, in uh, as as we, as we typically have in quantum field, yeah. So we have either wave or particle. So here we mostly measure in waves, yeah, and this like a truly particle is a very high energy, yeah. yeah. And we have a lot of instruments, yeah, to measure this. So actually our atmosphere is uh, pretty sophisticated. Uh, that's why we actually appeared, yeah, here on Earth, because it protects us against some uh, very destructive high energy um, uh, particles. So uh, we actually protected from this. And uh, so we, we can measure them only with satellite or if you go for very high energy gamma rays, so I will speak about, so we can still measure them in atmosphere. Yeah, so it's like a quick overview. So just to remind you, yeah, that the astronomy is a very diverse field. So it's not only optical, so it's a lot of different things. Yeah, and this very nice plot, I very like this. So uh, this plot shows us how astronomy is developed. Yeah, so here we can see the time when uh, some instrument is, is appeared. So actually, let's say electromagnetic astronomy exists, uh, I, I would say, with all of the uh, human mankind time scale. But yeah, here we can see the develop it, uh, development of the telescope. So it's actually first telescope developed. And in principle, uh, until let's say uh, middle of 20th century, we didn't develop any other instrument. Yeah, so actually uh, electromagnetic one. So the, the the white is again electromagnetic one. So here we can see the development of the radio telescopes, uh, like big dishes, yeah, of radio. And uh, here we go. So MEV TV. So it's already scales of uh, high energy gamma rays. So here's actually we developed uh, detectors which can detect uh, gamma rays, for example, from nuclear explosion. So it's actually this spy satellite was the first astronomical instruments. And uh, first detection uh, almost triggered yet another world war because it was detected, uh, it, it, it detected uh, actually cosmic ray emission, but uh, <laughs> uh, it was uh, considered to be from some nuclear yeah, tests and so on. And we also have a neutrino, so very weak inter uh, interactive particles and uh, cosmic ray astronomy, so it's also uh, something different. And as well, we have a gravitational wave astronomy as well. So, so now you can see that we just, uh, let's say, it's a, it's a, it's a cradle of, uh, yeah, of, 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 let's say, full of broadband astronomy right now, yeah? Okay. So now I come to particle physics, yeah, because we speak about high energy. So when we go to high energies, we have like only particles or we can touch the particle side of, of photons, not uh, the wave side. And for, I mean, because of, because of our scales, our scales as observers. Yeah, so uh, standard model of particle physics, I guess you, you, you know this very well because of the hype of Higgs boson. So, I mean, these lines, uh, showing you how particle interacts with each, each, each other. So actually, we have uh, particles which like can be freely detected only like uh, uh, neutrinos and electrons, but quarks, uh, gluons, ah, of, of course, photons, yeah, all of them are just uh, make our matter. So they're not free. So we can, we can detect these free particles only on accelerators when again we just destruct the matter and see. Uh, it uh, composition, yeah, and this is how 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 they how they interact with each other. So it's it's very complicated, it's very abstract diagram, but it's actually very nice. So this model has like only twenty three parameters, and uh, we can simply describe everything, yeah, except gravity, unfortunately. But uh, gravity was explained in the string theory lecture, so we can watch it one more time again. So okay, and uh, so this is actually our our matter. So consists of baryons, so it's like three quarks, but we have a lot of a lot of exotic matter which also obtained also obtained on colliders and actually were uh, produced in the very early stage of of universe, but then decayed. But then it can be again produced in in our cosmic rays, which we will be speaking about later. So actually, my point is that uh, we can see only like a very very small fraction of of the matter which can be let's say constructed from the basic basic structures, basical particles. Yeah, and this 
actually nice representation of the uh, group theory. So maybe maybe you know about this. So how we nicely represent all, all of the matter. Again, so you can see the proton and natron and all of these other guys, just exotic state. Uh, I mean, exotic particles and uh, some uh, excitation of, yeah, of, 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 of baryons. So you can see some S quark and so on. So, and the mesons, so uh, the particles which consist of two quarks. This is just to give you an overview, yeah, how, how rich our particle world. But uh, maybe fortunately for us, we consist only of stable particles, otherwise will be, life will be more complicated. Yeah. Okay, so we have particles, we have baryons, and of course, uh, so namely we have like only two baryons, yeah, in uh, most of our businesses, proton and natron, and from proton and natron we can construct all of our matter, yeah, and uh, okay, so this big bang, yeah, big bang fusion, so the uh, uh, very hot stages of universe, uh, not very hot, but pretty hot when all other uh, nuclei cannot be constructed, but actually uh, it's, so hydrogen helium happened when uh, plasma was uh, start to cooling and we can construct an, at least an atom, yeah? So one proton or proton and the natron and, uh, yeah, and uh, an electron on top of this. Yeah, so, uh, and all other elements actually constructed already in stars. So they are very, very young comparing to, to basic ones. And here you can see is actually, actually our peri periodic table uh, are very interesting. So uh, we have uh, some kind of standard construction of elements. Yeah, when we have just explosion of the stars, but actually all of all, all the heavy elements are uh, built after the collision of neutron stars. So actually we, uh, I would say, uh, observed only few collisions of the neutron stars, but it's uh, a nice proof that we can have yeah all of this part xenon, for example, yeah. Uh, arrive from, from from them. So yeah, so uh, as universe cooling, as we have a supernova explosions, and then, uh, so for example, if you have a binary star, so we, we produce this part of, uh, oops, sorry. Of periodic table, then we have a neutron star, star binary, and uh, after again, um, yeah. I'm, I'm afraid to, 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 to tell you about scale, time scale, but uh, in a not very long time comparing to uh, lifetime of universe, so these two natural star collides and we obtain a lower part of periodic table. So this is actually sim simply how our matter is constructed. So yeah, there's no other processes to, to build, let's say the earth, the human beings and so on. And, uh, of course, there's chemistry on top of it, but I, I will not touch this, of course. Okay, so uh, now it comes to cosmic rays. So um, in my previous slides, you, you, you may see that there's some uh, explosion, collisions, blah, 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 which produce a lot of particles, yeah? And these particles, we call them a cosmic rays. How we actually detect them? So we detect them absolutely uh, spontaneously because uh, Victor Hess uh, in Austria in uh, 1912, so he uh, tried to measure how uh, uh, ground radiation falls with the height. So we already know that there is a radiation, yeah, from granite, for example, or whatever. And it was was a nice idea to to make a plot, yeah. So how how it decrease how it decrease yeah with the height, yeah. Of course, uh, it was decreasing until some height, until some altitude, but later it started to increase again. So and uh, so. Since he was an Austrian, so and you know German language is very straightforward, so he just calls it like cosmic strahlung, so just a cosmic, cosmic rays. Yeah, and now, now we have this cosmic rays, after all. And uh, yeah, so we actually celebrate yeah this in uh, about ten years ago. So actually now cosmic rays has like um, hundred ten years only. Yeah, and uh, later it turned out that this single particle uh, not necessarily detected directly. But if it has very high energy, so it's, it collides with atmosphere and produce actually an air shower. So, so we call this air shower, so it's actually like a cascade of the particles. So we have a first interaction, then we disrupt the uh, nuclei of the atmosphere, and then we, let's say, make a, like a cascade of particles, and we can detect them just by coincident detection of, of um, in, a, in, a, in a different detectors on the ground. 
Yeah, and it was uh, detected like in uh, about after uh, 20, 30 years uh, after the detection of uh, cosmic rays. So it was detected by Pierre Rennes, France, and uh, and Skabelsen, Skabelsen in USSR. So around uh, in the first in the first half first half of the uh, of the 20th century. Yeah, so this is actually. Uh, uh, yeah, representation of air shower. So we have a primary particle which collides with uh, nitrogen. Yeah, because typically nitrogen, because nitrogen is the most abundant particle in the atmosphere, or maybe with oxygen, more rarely, but whatever. And now you see that it starts to produce actually mesons. It can produce muons and so on. So it actually can produce these short-lived particles. Yeah. Although one can can say, yeah, these uh, exotic particles are not very important, so we don't need to study this. But this actually happens every second. I mean, in our atmosphere, actually, the production of these particles, and these particles, of course, propagate, decay, and so on. It's a very nice schematic picture, but uh, in real life, it's a huge cascade. So uh, here you can see the cascade uh, produced by the particle of one exoelectron volt. So uh, you remember that uh, large hadron collider actually produce a, uh, accelerate particles to the TV energy tera electron volt, and I hope you 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 remember this. Yeah, a kilo, uh, giga, what 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 next? Tera, uh, peta, and exo. So from 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 tera to to exo, it's like a six orders of magnitude, and you can see that a single particle in atmosphere can produce a billions of different particles. Yeah. And a lot of actually muons, which we, we typically never have in our uh, standard life, but we have a lot of them. And actually, I would say half of half of the particles which we use now in colliders were first detected in cosmic rays. Actually, so cosmic rays were uh, really like a first particle experiments. Of course, then uh, uh, huge institutes built around colliders, and they more advertised, but actually, yeah, a lot of discoveries done just in, in these processes. And here, yeah, here on the right, you can see the realistic simulation. So it's not like a nicely one particle collides with the atmosphere like here, but uh, it's like a huge cascade. And in different colors, you can see a different part of uh, particles. So actually, I guess the blue one is uh, is a probably hadrons here. I didn't remember honestly. So uh, it's uh, like the first pions, like like you see here. Yeah, and uh, red is just an electromagnetic part. It's electrons, positrons, and uh, and gamma quant and uh, green, I believe it should be muons. Yeah, so it's actually a total mess. And the main challenge for us is for scientists. So what we're interested in is to actually detect the first the first particle, detect it, uh, re reconstructed energy, and reconstructed actually mass. So namely, what 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 it was like, uh, iron or proton or whatever. And we detected with a very different type of detector, so we can directly detect with a particle detector. So we just search for, uh, yeah, for particles which arrive to the ground or even under the ground. So for, for example, we can, on, on ground we can detect and mu uh, electrons and gamma quanta, but uh, actually if we shield this detector, so we can get a free muon detector only, muon only detector. And we can detect, of course, the light and the different light, like a Cherenkov light, Cherenkov light. So maybe maybe you remember what is this? It's uh, actually light produced in atmosphere uh, by particles which move in the faster than velocity of light in atmosphere, yeah, or or in every media, yeah. So for example, uh, in uh, in Wikipedia you can you can find like Cherenkov uh, article and you can see like a bluish emission of water in 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 um, in a reactor. So it's a, it's a Cherenkov light in in water in atmosphere. It's similar. Of course, not very intense because uh, the refraction coefficient is smaller, but still we can detect this, and I will show you how. And of course, we have neutrino, which are super hard to detect, and <laughs> you can see that they just propagate. So there is no detector for them, <laughs> maybe on opposite side of the Earth. And of course, with satellite and so on. Yeah, so we we, we develop very different techniques how to detect them, but uh, still it's it's very challenging to reconstruct what what happened in this point. Yeah. But still, we measure the spectrum to a very, in a very broad, broad energy range. So here, uh, actually, this scale is for, for for those who remember school physics. Joule, yeah, Joule is like a amount of energy 
one need to carry one kilogram for one meter. Yeah? And here you can see that uh, in the very end of energy spectrum, so we have a really physical, really mi microscopic energy. So it's, it's one drill, but it's a single particle. Yeah, and uh, there is a different features. Uh, they have very anatomic description and uh, like knee ankle. So it's actually not re really visible here, but if we rescale the scale, we can see really like a different uh, change in the slope of the spectrum. And uh, we try to understand why it's this. So uh, I mean, the main theory is that uh, here we have a galactic cosmic rays, which actually trapped in our galaxy because of the magnetic field <coughs> fields. Uh, and ankle, it's like, like uh, uh, our um, extragalactic accelerators, uh, produ produced by extragalactic accelerators. And uh, so our galaxy, is, it's, it's, it's pretty calm, pretty, I would say, uh, cold one. So we don't have a jet, we don't have a blazer. So actually, we, in our galaxy, we can hard to, it, for us, it's hard to produce uh, very high energetic particles, but if you have a for example, very bright uh, galaxy with a jet. So jet, it's like when a, when a dark matter, oh, oh sorry, <laughs> when a normal matter accretes uh, on the on the supermassive black hole. So it's 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 hits very very highly and it's produced like a jet. So I hope you you, you saw a lot of a lot of these uh, images. And of course, so here it's actually nuclei. So one can see so the mass composition of the cosmic rays. Yeah, this uh, plot obtained from direct mesh from uh, from satellite. So when 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 we put a satellite, so we can install the detector, like a collider, and uh, detect this particle with a very high precision. Because here you can see the flux flux is very high. So in this in in a direct measurements we have one particle per square centimeter per second. So it's actually like so they they count very very fast. While for highest energies, we have one particle per square kilometer per year. So actually, to detect a thousand particles, we need to build a thousand square kilometer detector. And actually, we build them. Yeah, uh, small spoiler. So one, one can actually ask, so why LHC energies uh, plot around exo-electron volts while, while it's accelerated to TV? So does anybody know why? No? OK because of the special relativity. So we have two particles moving with the almost velocity of light um, in colliders. And when we collide them, so we do not simply sum their energy. So we make a actually um, reference system calculation, so so-called gamma factor, yeah? Like uh, you remember then we can shrink or squeeze the time, uh, the, the distance and, and so on. And we can also recalculate the momentum of the particles. And when we collide, uh, them that it's similarly when uh, one high energetic particles collide the static one like in cosmic rays. So in principle, uh, yeah, to be honest, yeah, uh, a couple of LHC particles can approach these energies. Yeah, but single one accelerated only to to these ones. Yeah, Just some some interesting fact from astrophysics and from special relativity. Okay. So uh, yeah. So how we hunt for the highest energies? Yeah, I told this like one one particle per. Uh, square kilometer per year. So in in, uh, in in Argentina, so you know, there's like a lot of a lot of farms with the coast with the stakes and so on. So it's a lot of uh, kind of empty flat space. And there's the largest detector built uh, there. So the space between two dots is uh, just a one kilometer. So it's about uh, three thousand square kilometers. Here of these tanks, so this tanks is like uh, around my height. So it's uh, just tank with water and with a very sensitive detector and particle hits, it's, it's, it's produce a light inside the tank and we can detect this. And no other particle actually can, can do this except a cosmic, uh, except a particle from the cascade. Yeah, and here you can see that it's a very high energetic cascade. It's actually covers like a 10 square kilometers. Yeah, it's few detectors, but it's like a 10 square kilometers. And it's also optical detectors which uh, observe the development of the cascade in the atmosphere. And the maximum detected energy so far, it's like a zeta electron volt, yeah? So it's uh, three orders of magnitude higher than exa, it's 10 to 21. Yeah, and I, yeah, just remind you that LH energy is TV. 
Okay, yeah. So it's very nice. So we, we detected like uh, 20 orders of magnitude in cosmic rays. So let us find their sources. And uh, we didn't find any by direct observation of, of the cosmic rays. Does anybody have a clue why? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, because they charge. So it's, it's, it's actually nuclei. And since they charge, they inclined very um, significantly in the magnetic field. So we cannot simply trace them. And uh, as lower energy of the primary cosmic rays, as uh, more stronger is deflected. And actually, thanks to this uh, PRG observatory, yeah, starting from uh, four exo-electron volt, we can see some anisotropy and we can say, yeah, probably the highest uh, cosmic rays arrived from uh, from some galactic cluster. So this is a huge patch of sky. So uh, you, you can imagine it's like 40, about 40 degrees or so. So it's, it's really very hard to understand. Of course, we can, we, can, we can write down a series like, yeah, we have a supernova explosion, which produce blah, blah, blah cosmic rays, which we can detect. We can simply fit this, but we never see the source in cosmic rays. So we never see that uh, we have a lot of photons arrived from some particular patch of the sky. So it's fully isotropic. Okay, so how to detect them, yeah? Okay, so if, if cosmic rays are, uh, yeah, if cosmic rays are charged and uh, charged particles are uh, deflected in magnetic field, so how we can detect? So, okay, so let us detect a natural particle. So particles which do not have a charge to just pinpoint the accelerator. And uh, so for example, the very nice uh, natural particle is it's, it's gamma quantum. Yeah. So gamma quantum is very nice absorbed everywhere, so we can simply detect this. Yeah, and uh, for this we built a special telescope, so-called atmospheric Cherenkov telescope. So we again detect the Cherenkov light. And in this telescope one can see how, uh, for example, proton look like. And this is very nice plot from, from my colleague, so who actually yeah, explains the hard path of, of, of proton, which was emitted first in the opposite direction, but finally arrived to the Earth and the very direct gamma quanta, which produced very nice sausage here, and we can simply detect this. It's not, it's not actually very simple. So actually the fraction of gamma quanta is 10 to minus five. So it's one gamma quanta over about 1,000 or 10,000 photons, uh, sorry, protons. That's why we need to build such kind of detectors because it's with the surface ones, it's, it's really hard to detect. So because Again, we have a cascade and we can only image a cascade and from image we can uh, justify. Because here you can see there's a lot of particles on the ground. It's, it's, it's a really huge mess. And we built such huge machines. So it's, it's not the, the biggest one, but it's, 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 it's pretty, pretty nice. It's actually the first, the first approach to the uh, attempt to detect them. It was, it was really like a long way to detect gamma. It was uh, different. Uh, different telescopes in uh, in Europe, USSR, in in USA, but this one like was the first successful ones. And to detect the uh, Cherenkov photons, so it's, there's not 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 many photons from this cascade. So it's actually a kind of ten nanoseconds flash with very 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 few photons. So to to collect all of them, you, one need to build like a mirror of a scale of uh, meters or uh, tens of meters, and a very sensitive camera. And back to um, 1980s, so the first camera was only 37 pixels. So it wasn't like this very nice camera, it was only 37 pixels. And with this only 37 pixels, it was possible to detect a Crab Nebula. So my very first, my very first plot. And then camera, actually this particular telescope was so uh, uh, nicely constructed mechanically so that they, uh, these people actually built like uh, three more telescopes and uh, just simply upgraded the camera. So it's still actually still operating from uh, 2003. It was the last last upgrade, and this was already like uh, order of magnitude more pixels, yeah, than uh, than the first camera. But still, I mean, uh, this sin single pixel can can work on only in very dark conditions. So it's called photo mul photo electron multiplier. And uh, so if there is some uh, bright light like here, so it explodes immediately. So it has a voltage applied to it of, of a thousand of volts. So it's a very sensitive detector. 
to detect a really single single uh, photon. Yeah, and of course they're very expensive, so the, the cost is like a thousand of, of dollars or euro uh, per pixel. And so here's uh, the modern telescope, so it's called High Energy Stereoscopic System, HESS, so named after HESS, so you can recognize after the uh, uh, first, uh, after the, whom uh, created, uh, sorry, created, uh, discovered the cosmic rays. And uh, so this uh, telescope has like uh, 12 uh, meters uh, mirror diameter, this one has 28. And this one is actually the biggest one. So the area is about like uh, six, uh, 600 something. And uh, of course, if you point this towards sun, uh, you never do this, but uh, I mean, the camera will be melted like immediately or maybe even evaporated, I don't know. But Namibian sun is, is very bright. Yeah, of course, you, you can see some uh, some shelters here. So, I mean, they just like posing for for nice photo, but uh, typically they parked and as well as this camera as well. Yeah, so like a bird view of, of, of HES telescope. And uh, if some of you are doing astronomy, so you can you can understand these numbers like angular resolution of five seconds, source position of uh, uh, five minutes of uh, 10 seconds. But since we measure these particles not around the clock, but only in a very, very dark and uh, nights, mostly moonless, so observationally only 1,000 hours per year. So it's a very, very limited time. But still, yeah, we can, we, we can detect. And I just remind you that we count simple photons, so we do not make a photo. So we, we count a photon, and uh, then we drop these photons on... Um, um, let's say, on, on a sky, and then we, with a special algorithm, so we just oversample them, and then we create this nice nice plot. So it's, it's, it's a very nice supernova, uh, also one uh, happened uh, in, uh, in the Middle Ages. And uh, here, if I'm not mistaken, so in, in red, it's, uh, it's a dust, it's, um, I guess, uh, infrared. We, 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 we make a correction if, if I'm wrong, I mean, on, 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 on recording, maybe not. Uh, but what I what I remember is that this violet one it's actually it's a, it's a X-ray and we actually from this plot we can see this was exploded like this and expanded in 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 in, in this direction. So there's actually acceleration of of all particles and, and of cosmic rays of galactic cosmic rays happens like in these two two parts. So actually multivalence multivalence uh, measurements uh, gives us an opportunity to understand how process e evolved because having only dust we say yeah it's, it's just a bubble but i mean having bubble which emitting a uh, x-ray so we can see yeah explosion happened like like in this direction so it was was kind of asymmetric and uh, if you look to this supernova in has so we see only a shell so we actually don't see anything except the acceleration region yeah, and from this we say, yeah, ah, we see we see acceleration of gamma rays. Yeah, if you have gamma rays, of course we have cosmic rays. I mean, because we know quantum physics. Yeah, and uh, then we say, yeah, okay. So uh, some part of our uh, Earth's cosmic rays arise from from this particular supernova. And uh, this is kind of our current state of understanding of high energy universe. So this plot is uh, made by Fermilat experiment. So it's a cosmic experience as a satellite. So it measures like a uh, GV um, photons. And you can see, so the spectrum of photons similar to spectrum of cosmic rays. So we have a lot of high energy ones, a uh, few very high energy and only a few ultra high energy. And you can see that we have a very nicely, uh, yeah, galactic plane, a lot of extra galactic sources in, in high energy, um, cosmic rays, uh, uh, sorry, gamma rays. When we go to very high energies like a Cherenkov telescope, so yeah, we can still see galactic plane, but only very bright sources. And when we go to the ultra high energy cosmic rays, which is actually very nice. So when we have, when we need to detect ultra high energy cosmic rays, we again go from uh, imaging telescope to just a surface one, like uh, for cosmic rays, because our cascade is, is too big that we can again start to distinguish between uh, photons and protons. And uh, this lasso detector in China, it's a really ultimate instrument. So, I mean, it's, it's really 
hard to to build something something better in the nearest time because I mean they invested a lot of resources in this and, and built very nice experiment. And one can see that the sky in a ultra high energy race is very dark right now for, for us. But I mean, let's say uh, 12 years ago we even didn't have uh, this sky, so it's actually exposure of 12 years. This exposure of uh, also around 10 years. Uh, this exposure of just one year, so you can see how how actually fast uh, things are developed. Okay, so uh, yeah, I, I I have spoken a little bit about the neutrino. So neutrino is the lightest particles, uh, the hardest uh, to detect, and this was actually hardest to detect it at all. Not only astrophysical, but uh, I mean the neutrino itself. So the first one was detected in '56. So first of all. It was actually predicted by Wolfgang Pauli because they uh, studied the spectrum of electrons and it was really strange. So Pauli said, yeah, maybe we have one particle just simply emitted and we can never detect this because it's, it's, it's very light. It's like it was a similar problem as dark matter right now. So we, we kind of have some dark matter and we cannot detect this. So the same was neutrino, but neutrino was detected very fast. Uh, and since we did not detect uh, dark matter so far, maybe dark matter doesn't exist. So I don't know. I mean, it's, it's not like not like neutrino detection. It was detected very fast. But the cross section, so cross section means uh, how often a particle uh, collides with other particles or interact with other particles. And the cross section of neutrino, so you can see this minus 44. Uh, it's, it's super crazy. So, so to fully absorb, um, uh, particle of, I mean, uh, MEV neutrino, so it was around this energy in, in this telegram, yeah? So one needs a water of thickness of 100 light years. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Okay, so how can we detect them? So first of all, we have a lot of neutrinos, yeah? So finally we can detect one, and we need to build a lot of, uh, and we need to have a lot of water. I mean. So, so, so many that actually for uh, neutrino detection we use a uh, natural media. So we do not build like a, some, um, I mean, we do build some artificial ones, but I mean, the natural one was actually the first, first approach. And here's uh, uh, Moise Markov already after four years of the detection of neutrino. So say uh, literally like it's his uh, citation that, okay, so let us install detector deep in the lake or even in the sea and uh, yeah. Just, uh, let's say, again, use Cherenkov radiation to detect a neutrino. So Cherenkov radiation is like a single, or <laughs> one of the single instrument, yeah, to, to detect uh, any of cosmic particles. Yeah, and it was a super crazy project in uh, 1975. I mean, uh, people were excited by the uh, first human in space, first human in moon, and uh, they, they really liked to build uh, huge projects. This was one of the rare collaboration between uh, uh, USSR and USA. Uh, unfortunately, it uh, ended in uh, 1980, but actually, I mean, project was some kind of developed until 1995, but it's actually give a burst to all of our neutrino projects in natural media so far. So, of course, it was uh, hard to implement. I mean, even now we, we do not have such, such huge detectors. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but again, so uh, this, I very like this picture. So it's actually Kamiakanda. It's a Japanese experiment, and this is not natural media. So it's, uh, I would say, a natural, um, how to say, cave or natural mine. So it's a natural empty media, which actually full of, of the photo, photomultiplier, so which it also to detect a single, single photoelectron volt. So it's a, uh, just a couple of workers in the board who clean this or inspecting them. And uh, so you can see it's like a now, Super Kamiakanda it's have like a, a 13 kiloton of uh, super pure water. Ah, sorry, it's a 50 kiloton of super pure water and 13,000 of photo electron volts. So it's like a really huge bubble and we can detect neutrino. But yeah, these uh, neutrinos are for Low energies because again, their flux has a power low uh, nature. So uh, as higher energies as as lowest we have, so we we must build like a very huge detectors, and yeah, and and, and we build them. 
So it's actually uh, the, the biggest one. It's a kind of gigaton, so it's only like one square kilometer. So it's even less than demand initially, even after 50 years. So it's a really crazy experiment. So uh, they drill uh, ice in Antarctica with uh, boiled water of 80 degrees because they also have a high, high uh, altitude. So it's hard to boil water higher than uh, 80 or 80 something. Yeah, and then just uh, put them, throw them in the ice and they stay there forever. So if there are any mistakes, so uh, you make in production, so you, you will never fix it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, so it's like a dense model and this a lot of strings with, so, so this small dot is just uh, again, such huge uh, um, photo detector. And the distance between two strings, like a hundred meters. So it's, it's supposed to detect very high energy neutrinos and how it's actually detected. Yeah, so here you can see. So neutrino can, again, after a standard model, yeah, neutrino either can produce just a muon and uh, and muon just uh, nicely propagate and emit chering of light and we detect chering of light in these photo detectors. And so here you can see, so the muon, single muon from single neutron, uh, neutrino traveled uh, one kilometer in ice and uh, leave us very nice trace. Or neutrino can just hit a nuclei and produce a cascade, which is really hard to re reconstruct because it's almost uh, like a spherical, spherical emission. Eh? One can kind of see a bit of momentum, but it's, it's, it's very hard. So people use uh, machine learning for this to, to try to recover and so on. Okay, so let's, let, let's come to finally to multi-messenger astronomy. So uh, I guess you, you understand, yeah, that we have different messengers. So I start from cosmic rays. So we, we call this a one messenger. We have a gamma ray, another messenger. We have a neutrino, yet another messenger. And we have also gravitational waves uh, force. Messengers, so why, why it's force messengers? Because we have like a force fields. Yeah, strong field, cosmic rays, uh, electromagnetic, uh, it's a gamma, neutrino weak interaction, and uh, gravitational waves. Okay, so what is this about? This is a very nice plot I very like. So let us uh, just imagine that we have like kind of multi messenger source. So let's say, let's consider uh, two neutron stars, yeah, which collides and produce a lot of gold. So you will be super rich if you can yeah, arrive them. And uh, so this collision can produce gravitational waves. So you can see this uh, kind of uh, bumps on the <laughs> space time can produce a cosmic rays, which yeah, have a very complicated um, trajectory, can produce neutrino, can produce gamma. Yeah, and all of this, all of these particles actually connected to each other. Maybe gravitational waves a bit disconnected, but okay. At least three of them are connected. So this is actually a reaction. So like, like in chemistry, so we can just write down like, okay, proton collides with proton, produce uh, uh, pi zero and something, and this pi zero decays into two gammas. Okay, so can produce pi, charged pi on, and this can uh, decay into muon, and et cetera, et cetera. Or a proton can uh, collide with gamma quanta, produce again this exotic particle. Yeah, we cannot escape them and uh, so on. And then we can detect, yeah, this uh, final products like neutrinos or gamma quanta or even protons. And they connect it in a few words with a very simple relation. So in principle, if you have some source and we detect different particles, we can relate them to each other and we can understand what happens there. Yeah, and uh, all of these messengers have a, uh, yeah, different, uh, different features like cosmic rays, ultra easy to detect. It's, it's like my uh, personal scale, yeah. This personal scale actually uh, graded with a, a time of detection, so it's super easy because it's first detected, second particle detected, third and fourth. And uh, for example, cosmic rays and gamma rays has a horizon because uh, our universe is not is not empty. So uh, during propagation, they either absorb or collide with a, even with a, just a background light or background radio. So although uh, the cross section is very small, but when particle propagate for mega or gigaparsecs, it will suffer sooner or later uh, from the collision on other particle and lose its energies. But neutrinos, you can see it's a, it's a really non-interacting, so it can pinpoint us directly to the source. There's a lot of gravitational waves. Yeah, so moreover, this, all of these messengers have very different features and we try to collect them. 
And uh, I, I hope you, you heard about yeah first gravitational wave detection of signal from the neutron star merger in 17. So it's actually so far it's only a single uh, multi messenger detection uh, involving a gravitational wave. So so far we have uh, only um, black hole merger detected. But let's say first multi messenger detection not involving uh, gravitational wa waves happened in uh, 1980 in the explosion, supernova explosion in Large Magellanic Cloud. It's uh, our satellite galaxy to the, to the Milky Way. And uh, yeah, so here you can see the shell very nicely in, uh, in, uh, in photons, yeah, in electromagnetic. And uh, few, few detectors, yeah, uh, which was available at that time. And there's a lot of different legends and histories about uh, how they performed at, the, at that point. We can, yeah, we, can, we can discuss this offline. So they detected also a few neutrinos during the explosion. So we have really detection of supernova explosion have a really like a spike in neutrinos. Like for example, if you detect one neutrino per week, we detected like a, uh, how many? 20 neutrinos in, uh, in 12 seconds, yeah? It's, I mean, not, not one per week, but uh, very rare. So, so it was um, clear detection. Okay, and uh, finally, it was also detected uh, coincidentally neutrino from astrophysical source from Blazer by Ice Cube. And uh, Ice Cube uh, issued an alert. So we have like astronomical telegrams, which, yeah. Uh, sorry, we have an alert and we have an astronomical telegrams and you can see, so here it was an alert. And uh, later after this alert, so uh, like Fermilat and the Magic, so it's yet another Cherenkov telescope. So they measured this region as well. And they also detected uh, some increase in the some blazer flare. So here it's like uh, looking Fermilat, uh, and this uh, how looking magic. And uh, so here you can see the let's say uncertainty uh, region from from neutrino detector. So the resolution of neutrino detector is is, is very poor, but still uh, can 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 be somehow. Um, Associated, I mean, both detections from uh, neutrino and from from gamma telescopes. Yeah, and this actually saw the again multi messenger observation of this blazer. You can see it from the from the radio uh, till neutrino. Yeah, so it's actually this actually brought us a lot of information because again neutrino uh, point us to a weak interaction or to some um, uh, strong interaction as well, and. Even having a single neutrino, so we can uh, fit our models or interpolate our models and understand what's happening in the jet in this in this period of time. I mean, it's it's a very speculative uh, science, but uh, so far we have only this. Okay, so uh, now I approach to our next gen experiments, and uh, we'll say a few words about uh, you know, how how we approach to petascale to really data science. So uh, yeah, so you, you can see that actually our particles are very rare. So now we don't care about any data science except uh, machine learning when we need to reconstruct this. Yeah. Okay. So one of the coolest experiment is a square kilometer array, and uh, so you can see that the data transfer rate will be 7.2 tera terabits per second. So it's uh, 60,000 antennas on a square kilometer. I mean, this this guys this like a logarithmic antennas and uh, also also a lot of dishes with cameras inside. So when dishes will produce like 8.8 uh, .8 terabits. So actually this data rate is higher than on Large Hadron Collider, much higher and it's a big challenge. So I guess so far maybe we even do not have uh, such technologies to handle these data rates. It's, it's not like only data science, it's actually I would say hardware science already this, or data transmission science. Yeah, so the other uh, telescopes, uh, so it's, it's called Vera Rubin Observatory, or it's uh, former called like more, more boring, like legacy service of space and time. So this will be the largest camera in the world ever. So it's a 3 billion pixels camera. And uh, yeah, so this will produce like uh, 30 terabytes per night. So it will be super high res uh, imaging of the 
of the sky. And if I'm not mistaken, so the entire field of view, I mean, the entire visible space, I mean, visible by this telescope, uh, can be done like in one or two weeks with the high res. So here we can really, so legacy servers of space and time. So here we can really check how our dark uh, energy works, how the uh, universe is expanded and so on. And uh, we have our, uh, the history of, of universe or snapshots in a very, <laughs> very high resolution. So it's now it's on construction site. It's pretty old picture, but it's uh, going to be commissioned, uh, I guess, next year or so. So this will be optical telescope. So the previous one, the radio, so it will be optical and the high energy telescope. So you can see that, uh, yeah, in HES we have five telescopes, the, the largest number of telescopes so far. So it will be like a chain of telescope array with a very diverse techniques. So huge telescope, uh, like a middle uh, dish telescope and the small ones. So it's a, it's a north one, it's a south one. So it will be in two hemispheres. And this will consist, uh, okay, depending on inflation rates, not, not uh, universe inflation, but uh, yeah, uh, dollar inflation. So uh, about 100 of telescopes, which is also very complicated, yeah, to, 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 to make them working together. And uh, of course, IceCube also plan to, be, plan to be expanded, like simply in, in, in 10 times from now. And uh, yeah, just, just adding more strings to, to detect uh, more highest energy. Neutrino. So, so, so now, uh, yeah, so we, we, we astrophysicists, we unfortunately didn't invent something else except just expanding. But maybe there will be kind of a science revolution and we will become uh, more, more smart and invent something more sustainable, I would say. Okay, gravitational wave detects, I will not cover this. I guess I'm already out of time and it's, it's also yet another high tech topic. Okay, so data science project in astroparticle physics, yeah, my, my, my last topic. So, um, yeah, so here it's a nice plot. So here we actually estimate how um, our existing and uh, future telescope will be in uh, data production. So uh, you can see electromagnetic, gravitational wall and astroparticles. So for gravitational uh, waves, we have no problem with the data science, but uh, speaking about electromagnetics, so it's like 10 to three petabytes per year. So it's already uh, exascale, right? Yeah. yeah, per year. And uh, so we need to handle this data. So of course, SK, yeah, in the top, but CTA also pretty, yeah, pretty complicated. And uh, since yeah, we physicists are very conservative, so we're still using very old technologies. So it will be really challenge to handle, to store this data, to analyze this data, to reanalyze this data, yeah. And uh, there's a lot of initiatives. So now I just give you like, um, like a general overview. So like a, it's a very uh, yeah, clear plan. So how, 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 how to make data fair. So I guess you know what is fair. So the main point is actually, the, so, the, so we, we should have public data for public money. Yeah, so far it's only like a few telescopes uh, where you can take a data, analyze them without any like, you know, very deep knowledge and so on. Of course, you need to virtual observatory and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, there's a lot of uh, pillars. So um, the also one, I mean, besides availability and analysis of the data, a very important point for us is actually simulations and development of methods. So those of you who will come uh, tomorrow, so we'll 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 hear talks on this, because. Yeah, we, we, we understand more or less quantum physics, but not at such high energies. And even simulation of this cascade is a billion particles and a lot of interpolations there. And uh, so we simulate some process and we need to somehow uh, compare this with the real data, take into account all of the systematic, all of the biases which can be in the model. And if you need to simulate this for a terabytes of data, yeah, we should make a very precise shot, yeah, to not to redo all of this calculation because the simulations are very computer intensive because I mean, it's like you, you simulate like a billion of, of processes, not processors, but processes in physics. Yeah, of course we need to real time analysis, which is like more or less fine. I don't know, uh, not maybe, maybe for SK it's an issue. And of course these three points are very important because we don't want to waste our data. Yeah, after, our, after all of this million of uh, yeah, investments. It's a, it's a very big, big challenge in science. 
because we're really short of in, in manpower and funding and, and so on. So it's, it's, it's a very nice seven pillars, but how to implement them. It's a lot of different yeah, approaches and uh, all of them partly realized in individual experiments and how to actually merge uh, all of them in a single framework. It's a, it's a big issue. Yeah, and uh, so, so for example, some data mining yeah, for present and future experiments. So yeah, we have working experiments like uh, we have an archive and uh, now people, let's say, kind of trying to learn on archival data how to go for um, for a next gen. So to, to analyze data very fast and uh, to get a reliable uh, results in a, with a reasonable time and so on. And uh, now this huge future experiment, so they do very nice approach. So they make a data data challenges. Uh, this data challenges sometimes open, sometimes semi-open, but this is a point that they just simulate the data, yeah, to some precision to what they plan to observe and just uh, yeah, dump this data to community, to either scientific community or to, I guess, LSST has a really full full access. I mean, this three billion cameras, so one can just simply take the simulated data set and try to to to, to make, uh, for example, uh, classification, yeah, or whatever. Yeah. So this some kind of approaches we, we we try to with this approach we try to address future challenges when we have like a peta 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 scale data sets. Yeah, and uh, it's also a very nice uh, roadmap um, document from Astronet. So Astronet is just a yeah, kind of group of agencies which yeah, try to, to at least somehow organize the scientists yeah, in a single stream. And this is also like a, like different tires. So now for, for LHC, we also have a different tire. So we have like tire zero, one, two, three. And uh, yeah, so first tires, it's uh, very close to the instrument. So uh, this data are responsible for uh, for calibration for uh, raw data, and uh, yeah, some higher tires they are just uh, yeah doing some high level analysis and so on. So there is uh, different movements, and uh, yeah, uh, we do also our own uh, business. So we 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 trying to we trying to uh, approach a private sector because I mean uh, you guys better know. Uh, how to, how to deal with data and uh, so we we, we uh, yeah physicists often arrogant but yeah we we, we try to we try to, <laughs> to 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 break this break this problem yeah and to 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 come to community finally yeah yeah so um, this is uh, already like my private part uh, I mean my 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 private points which which I think it's important. Yeah, so uh, the computing in astroparticle physics still underestimated, although we have this very nice uh, initiative, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, in, in reality, it's uh, a bit problematic. Yeah, And uh, of course, there's demand in society to be involved in astrophysics research because, yeah, comparing to, for example, string theory, it's at least understandable Yeah, what we are doing and uh, have a much lower threshold yeah, to, to jump in. And of course, I mean, uh, yeah, we can do programs, internship workshops, like uh, tomorrow and after tomorrow to approach data analysis problems. So we can dedicate this directly to data analysis, yeah, problems. And for example, students from partner universities can apply their knowledge to fundamental research. I mean, this is like a motivation uh, for uh, for a jet lab in in, in jet brains, so astroparticle lab in jet brains. And we, we try this uh, yeah, for different data already for uh, cosmic rays detectors, for, uh, for radio detectors, even for gravitational waves a little bit. Uh, and uh, of course, these points are also very important, like uh, yeah, to have a machine learning visual observers for, uh, yeah, for digital, sparse digital arrays. It's yet another topic. And uh, yeah, and outreach, of course, because yeah, I guess uh, you, I, I believe that uh, you didn't know about the most of, 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 of things which I was talking last hour. Yeah, so, um, yeah, and it's it, it kind of successful, I would say, I mean, this, this approach. So uh, I guess we, we established lab like uh, two years ago and so on. It's now it's moving somehow towards. Yeah, and uh, so here's my conclusion, I guess.
everybody starts, so I will not read this, so and yeah, please ask your questions. Yeah, thank you.